Hi everyone, I'm here today to start a new themed reading vlog and I am excited about this because it is very different to what I've done before but I was going through, I have my laptop here so you know I mean business, I was going through Salt Publishing's website. Salt have published many of my favourite short story collections and they were the first independent publisher that I really fell down a rabbit hole with about I don't know, 12 years ago. I used to review their books a lot when I had a written blog uh, and I used to interview their authors and all of that stuff. Anyway, I was going through their catalogue and I realised that they have this mystery box that you can purchase. So it's buying a box of 10 books and you don't know what those books are gonna be. I'm guessing that they're clearing out some backlist titles. 10 books for 25 pounds that's ridiculous, that's £2.50 per book. And I thought that might be fun and also interesting for a video. And then I thought, well, I do have quite a lot of salt titles already, but when I clicked on it, it popped up with a box saying, do you want to leave a note to the seller? So to, to Chris and Jen who run the company. So I have written a note writing down some of the titles that I already own. I've probably forgotten some because I was doing it off the top of my head. Some titles that I already own, asking them if possible, I understand maybe they can't do it because I don't know how the system works, if possible, if they could avoid these titles because I already have them. But I also thought it would be a good opportunity to tell you about these titles because some of them are books I read ages and ages ago. Uh, so let me tell you what was on my list. And some of these are recommendations, some of these are books I didn't enjoy hugely. Um, so I will tell you which ones are the ones that I would say go check out yourself. So. I loved Folklore by Tim Atkins. It's a very fragmented poetry collection that I read a long time ago. I think probably I would still enjoy it now, but it definitely spoke to me whenever I read it over a decade ago. Data Trace is uh, another poetry collection that I really enjoyed. Broken Things is a collection of short stories by Patricia Tarrant, which is creepy and disturbing and I would definitely recommend. The Other World It Whispers by Stephanie Victoire I also enjoyed. It's a collection of magical realism short stories with some ghostly elements. The Lighthouse and He Wants. Both of these books are by Alison Moore and um, The Lighthouse was long-listed, short-listed, can't remember, for the Booker Prize a few years ago, which was a huge deal because Salt is a very small publisher. The Clocks in the House was a book I did not enjoy. I did not like the representation of disfigurement in that book. The Rental Heart by Kirsty Logan was my introduction to the lovely Kirsty's book, um, and it's great. I love her work. You know that. The Book Collector by Alice Thompson is the book of theirs that I recommend the most. I have talked about it a lot on this channel over the years. It is heavily inspired by Jane Eyre and also by fairy tales. It's about a woman called Violet who marries a man that she's only just met and then she discovers he has lots of secrets. He has a hidden book of fairy tales. He also had an ex-wife called Rose, so he likes women who are like flowers to him, delicate, he wants to sniff them in a weird way, look at them, perfume vibes, you know, by Patrick Sushkind. And also women are going missing and turning up dead as a... Uh, fairy tale creatures. It's great. I, I loved it. Then we've got Bodies of Water, which was an interesting look at hydrotherapy in Victorian times and hysteria and how women were treated. Then we have got The Litten Path, which is a great book looking at class um, in the north of England and politics in the 80s. I read that a couple of years ago. It's not my favourite book I've ever read published by Salt, but I definitely enjoyed it. New World Fairy Tales by Cassandra Parkin. Again, one of my top three books that Salt have ever published. It's a collection of Grimm's fairy tales retold in modern times. For instance, there is a version of Snow White where Snow White is a drag queen. I don't think I need to say any more. You can go read that. Liminal by B. Lewis is a novel that didn't really work for me and not one I would particularly recommend. The Nightjar is a collection of poetry I haven't read yet. Melting Point is also a, a short story collection I haven't read yet, and I haven't read Lux yet, which is by Amy Key, which is also a poetry collection. The Knife Draw by Patricia Tarrant, which I had hoped to love, because I loved her short story collection, Broken Things, but I, I really didn't like the representation of disability in that at all. 
Frost Fairs by John McCullough was my introduction to his poetry. I really enjoy his work and have read subsequent collections by him. Feral is also a poetry collection that I really enjoyed. If you like Anne Sexton's poetry, I think you would really enjoy that. Birdhouse by Anna Woodford, again, is a poetry collection I really loved and I really enjoyed Milk Fever by Caddy Benyon as well. Tomorrow We Will Live Here by Ryan Van Winkle and also Me and the Dead by Katie Evans Bush are both collections of poetry that I would also recommend. I am very sorry to editing me for having to edit in all of those covers. That was, uh, that was a list and I'm sure that I have actually many more of their books on the bookcase, but I wanted to do it by memory and also if I included every single one I thought that would be really taking the mick. And as I said to Chris when I put in this order, if he can't accommodate not including any of these titles, that's totally fine. I get it. I can't expect, you know, executive treatment like that when it's a box of books of 10 for £25. But I just wanted to throw it out there in case it was easy to avoid these titles because they do publish. A lot of books. So I have put in that order and now I guess I just wait for the books to arrive and when they do arrive what I would like to do is read some of them. I'm probably not going to read all 10 because I don't know how many of them I'm going to really want to read. This is a, a gamble and an experiment. It could go horribly horribly wrong. The books could arrive and I could look at all 10 of them and think I am not interested in a single one, but I am hoping that there are going to be at least three or four that I am intrigued by to make all of this worthwhile. So keep your fingers crossed. Um, as with any vlog, I'm going to be including some walking footage and also some cooking footage as well. If you're new, I should have said this at the beginning. My name is Jen. Hi, I'm an author and a book reviewer. Welcome to my channel. While I wait, I'm going to be doing lots of things, but for you, while you wait, I am going to be making a ginger and lime cheesecake. I have been dreaming about this cheesecake. I will link the recipe in the description box down below. The annoying thing with cheesecake is that you make it and then you have to really leave it in the fridge overnight and I have to exert some self-control, but uh, I think I can manage. So insert footage of that here and then I'll come back when the box arrives. possibly going to regret filming this bit sitting on the floor but I have started now so let us move forward. The box has arrived, I haven't looked inside yet, I've only just taken the sellotape off. It arrived in an old Doc Martens box. I appreciate the recycling and inside we've got some tissue paper and we have got a postcard which says thanks Jen, I hope you find something here you love. All best 
Jen. So Jen is uh, one half of the salt. It's run by Chris and Jen, who are a married couple. Okay, let us dive in. And actually, something I forgot to say in the last clip is that you could choose to have fiction or poetry or a mixture of fiction and poetry. And I went for the mixture. So they look like this. And judging by the spines, I think that we've got six poetry collections here and four novels and I have spied that there is one title in here that I have read before and loved but it's not a title that I remembered to list in that box so Chris and Jen haven't given me any books that I asked them to avoid because I already own them for which I'm very very grateful so the only book that I have read in this pile already is this which is Somewhere Else or Even Here by AJ Ashworth it's a collection of short stories and I would say if you enjoy Karis Bray's work then you'll really enjoy this because um, it's based around family and it's mostly realist short stories as well thoroughly enjoyed them. I will pass this on to someone who I know will love it. All right, let's go through the other nine books and actually sitting on the floor was a mistake. So let's go find somewhere more comfortable. I have come downstairs to sit on the sofa, which is much more comfortable. All right, so the next book is by Anna Woodford, who I did actually mention in the first clip because I listed her book Birdhouse as a book I'd read and loved. And this is her most recent collection, which is called Changing Room. I know that Anna is from the Northeast, like me. She writes about Durham a lot. And the blurb says that these poems revisit old rooms and find new ones following the birth of a child and the passing of time in the family home and beyond. So I definitely want to read this. And next up is a book I have never heard of before. It's called September's by Christopher Prendergast. And this is a novel. It says on the back, we meet Matt lying across the back seat of his on off girlfriend's car. And he begins a long confession. It starts with wrestling moves and continues past statue fires, reaching bomb threats and assault via episodes in the life of Franz von Papen, the chancellor of interwar Germany. Piece by piece, Matt presents us with a map of his failures, or is he part of some grander universal mess? Maybe I'm gonna read the beginning of this and see if I enjoyed the prose. If I read that blurb in a bookshop, I wouldn't think, oh, I must buy that book. Next is another author I've never heard of before. This is a poetry collection. It's called Room of Thieves by Angela Cleland, or Clayland, I'll look that up. And the beginning of the blurb says, a six-toed cat skeleton, a lesson in boxing technique and a poem in the shape of a phallus. These are just some of the things you can expect to find in uh, Clayland's second collection, Room of Thieves. So there we go. Um, I will add this to the pile along with Changing Room as a book that I'm gonna read in this vlog. Should we do the rest of the poetry collections while we're talking about poetry? So we've got David Briggs's Cracked Skull Cinema. This says it is a collection of poetry on culture, society, media, power, about uh, reflections on middle age, on life's loves and losses. Again, probably not one that I would be immediately drawn to pick up, but I will read a couple of poems in there and see if I want to read the whole thing. Then we've got the Sonambulist Cookbook. I love the word. Sonambulist, Sleepwalker by Andrew McConnell. And I really love the sound of this one. It says that these are poems that explore the quality of disappearance, slowly breaking down as the poems swing from rogue sonnets to fractured prose poems. This one is definitely more my cup of tea, I think. So adding to the pile of books that I will be reading. And then the final poetry collection before I move on to the novels, we've got Rose with Harm by Daniel Hardesty. The blurb doesn't really give much away, um, but I will give this one a shot. Onto the pile it goes, that sounded very harsh, that slap there, onto the pile it goes. Next, I love this cover, this is The Watch by B.B. Berkey. Now the blurb of this one sounds good, it says, one sweltering midsummer night, two young women form an unlikely bond. How can they lead good lives, they wonder? What will they give to the world? By the time the sun comes up, their futures have been rewritten and their fates decided. Captivating and involving this haunting mystery is a tale of vicariousness, virtue and privilege. This one is definitely going on there. Yes, I will be reading that 
in this vlog pile. This one, I wasn't sure when I was looking at the blurb, but I've just read the first sentence and I am intrigued. So this is A Perfect Explanation by Eleanor Astruther, and it says that this is a fictionalized account of the true story of Enid Campbell, granddaughter of the eighth Duke of Argyle, who sold her son to her sister for 500 pounds. Um, so we interweave one significant day in 1964 with a decade during the interwar period. And the first sentence of this novel is, what irritated Finetta about her mother was not the lack of love, but the obvious hatred. I don't know why, but that really tickled me. So, okay, all right, I'll be reading that one too. And then the final book is this one here, which is Elephant by Paul Pickering. I'm not hugely convinced by the blurb that this one is for me, but it says, in a country house in England, a precocious teenage exile from revolutionary Russia sets down his adventures on paper, beginning with his first ball in St. Petersburg and how he frees a huge African elephant from a cruel circus. A hundred years later, an American academic begins receiving the manuscript from an anonymous sender, one chapter at a time, and seeks to uncover the truth behind the boy's extraordinary life. I mean, dual timelines like that, where there is a writer involved and then a manuscript remind me of things like Tales of the Time Being by Ruth Ezeki, which I really do love, um, but I am, I'm not sure that the subject matter in this one is going to really gel with me, but again, I am going to read the beginning and see if it pulls me in. So actually, out of the 10 books, there was one that I've already read before and really enjoyed. There are three that I am not sure about, but I will try the beginnings of to see if my opinion changes. And then there are six books that I'm going to give a go. To be fair, a couple of these are poetry collections, so their size makes it easy for them to be books that I can read and then form a quick opinion on. Um, it isn't as though every single one of these blurbs appeal to me a lot, but I am intrigued by them and I'm really looking forward to seeing how I get on with these books. And obviously I'm going to report back, so I will come back to you when I have some thoughts to share. Hi, it is a couple of days later. I tried Rose with Harm by Daniel Hardesty and this one is not my cup of tea. Poetry especially is such a personal thing. These poems seem to cover quite a long period of time. And I think that on the whole, I prefer collections that really pinpoint a certain theme. I remember Andrew Macmillan saying, um, because someone had asked him, how do you know when a poetry collection is finished? And he said, you think of it as a house, the book like a house, and you try and find every single way in that you possibly can until you have exhausted all of the entrances slash exits. And I just love that. I definitely prefer a heavily themed collection, and this one isn't one of those. But I did like the way that sound was used sometimes, and here is an example of that. The street lamp stands beyond the window sash, unable to shiver. There is something to say about this, the light above the river, the forgery of clouds, the huge grey and empty space. I like that. So yeah, there are a few poems in here that I enjoyed, but on the whole, not a collection for me. And now I am reading A Perfect Explanation by Eleanor Anstruther. And what I didn't realise before I started reading this is that Eleanor is writing about her family history. This is a book that's split across two time periods, some of which is in the 1920s, some of which is in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, there's a man called Ian who is Eleanor's dad. So she's writing this fictionalised account of his childhood and adult life based around memories that he has and facts that she has managed to discover, which I find really interesting. I'm not always drawn to dual timeline narratives. Occasionally that device is used by writers because they can't sustain one time period and they need a distraction, but there is definitely mirroring and tension going on in this book between the two time periods. It feels as though it definitely works together as opposed to just two entirely separate things. So far I am, I hesitate to use the word enjoying it. I think that it is very well written, but I am finding it difficult to read. Not because it's it's hard to get my head around or anything like that, but in the 1920s section, we're following Edith, who is struggling with motherhood, has, has postpartum depression, and one of her children is disabled. And she believes that he is sinful, that she needs to heal him through Christ. And basically there is some torture going on. Um, 
she thinks that she's helping him but it's really really difficult to read those sections we're trying to find out what has happened between the 1920s bit and when the children are grown up i'm definitely intrigued I'm gonna keep reading but for now mr m's mum is away on holiday and i need to walk over to her place to feed penny slow the tortoise which is the family pet so let's go and do that hopefully I'm in frame here I have no idea because I'm filming this on my phone and I'm using the back camera so I, I can't see myself um it is still too hot to walk outside with a wig on so the wig is off but I've come over I've given Penny some very green food and I have done the opposite for myself because there is a place not too far from here that is essentially vegan McDonald's and I was having a craving so I've ordered some of that I'm gonna eat that read some of Changing Room by Anna Woodford and then walk back home and, and get back to work. But I also wanted to show you our house plants. You may remember that we had to leave them here because of Mr. M's asthma and they have come into their own. They are huge. They're like a small jungle and they're kind of amazing. So this is what they look like now. Uh, but yeah, I will catch up with you later on. <laughs> reading A Perfect Explanation by Eleanor Anstruther and the title is kind of ironic in that there is not a perfect explanation for a particular event in this book or at least characters keep on trying to come up with explanations as to why certain things have happened and those explanations always fall short. I don't think I really explained very well what the book was about in the last clip. As I said, it's split over two time periods. We've got the 1920s section and in the 1920s section we're following Enid who has given birth to several children and in the 1960s section we are following her children as they go to visit her in a nursing home. In the 1920s section Enid is dealing with postpartum depression. As I said, one of her children is disabled and she thinks that she can cure him through God, which is very difficult to read. That becomes less as the novel progressed and that increased my enjoyment of the book just because it was so difficult to, to read that part. Um, I think that the pacing of this book is really wonderful. I think that it has some very touching moments and some very humorous moments as well. Um, one of these very human moments is in a cafe in the 19... 60s section between two of the siblings. What will you have, madam? Madam. She didn't feel like madam. She felt six. And I just really love that, that small moment of her allowing herself to be vulnerable in that second and then she immediately puts a front back on and gets back to the conversation. Enid's sister in the 1920s section, Joan, is friends with the Bloomsbury group. Um, she's a queer woman and Enid hasn't realised this but her husband has and her husband thinks that it's a great time. Uh, Enid is just not very aware of everything around her. She's very much in her own bubble and what I think is really wonderful about this book is that it is about real life events and these have been crafted and embellished, um, not to stretch facts or anything like that, but to fill in gaps. But because it's based on real life, you would think that that would limit it a bit. But actually, I feel like Eleanor has written this novel in a way that doesn't feel as though it is trapped within certain boundaries. She's made it feel as though this is the only way this story could have rolled out. She made me really believe in her as the author, I suppose, instead of just history existing. And I think that that is something to be really celebrated. I enjoyed this book a, a lot. And I think in moments where she could have gone really big when particular things happened, 
she did something very clever in shrinking back and allowing the magnitude of certain moments to speak for themselves. I admired that too. So yeah, I would recommend that one. And I would also recommend Changing Room by Anna Woodford, which I have just finished reading too. Anna has a lot of fun with using line breaks, which is something that I really love as well. And if I can just get it to focus on this particular line now I've just realized that in the viewfinder it is backwards for me so it's going to be difficult for me to read it let me see if I can peer around here and read it so where it's underlined I hold my son in my living room and try to keep my mother talking about Saturday or the one after etc so I hold my son in my living room so living room is obviously a place in the house but it also could be meaning the land of the living in the realm of the living and I like the way that she says my living room as if he's existing in this world of life that she has created because she has brought him into this world and the next line is and I try to keep my mother talking but there's a comma after the word mother and I try to keep my mother so she's trying to keep her mother talking but she's also trying to keep her mother in this room of living in in the world of the living to stop her dying she's trying to keep her in place it's really subtle but i really really love that this collection is all about the like venn diagrams of childhood and motherhood and i think that changing room is a really apt title because of that there's some wonderful imagery in here too in one of the poems she talks about her skin brailing when she goes swimming so getting all those dots on her skin it's very quiet it feels like a hug this collection i very much enjoyed it and what I might do when I'm reading another poetry collection in this vlog is do a close reading of one of the poems and we can we can annotate together because I thought that might be quite fun but so far so good <laughs> Good morning, a very quick clip before I get shower dressed and crack on with work for the day. So last night I gave September's a go and this book, as I guessed, isn't for me if the main character describes a female character via her breasts, I'm probably not gonna be <laughs> into it. Um, so yeah, tone of this one, not my personal taste, but then I started reading The Watch by B.B. Berkey instead, and I am intrigued by this. I'm gonna do some book maths, which I think will intrigue some of you just by the first section of this book. So the book maths that I'm gonna say is that if you put the film before sunrise and the secret history together and smushed them together and made a sandwich, you would get the first section of this book. And to be honest, that seems like very high praise. The reason that I put these two things together is because this book opens at a university. It's the end of summer term. Feels like Oxford or Cambridge. A narrator is getting ready to leave, but she's called into her tutor's office. Her tutor is a very unsympathetic person, not very into the human feelings. And she says to her, look, I have to go out this evening and I need you to spend the evening with this girl, Danielle, because she's threatening to, air quotes, do something stupid. I am worried about insurance and the reputation of our school and I've called her parents to come pick her up but in the meantime I want someone to keep an eye on her because you know that seems like the thing that we should be doing but I really don't want to waste my energy on it. As I said, she's not a very feelings type of person. Our narrator has never met Danielle or at least can never remember having met the student before and she's really stressed about the weight of this responsibility. She takes it very seriously. She goes to meet Danielle. They sit in the room together. I was worried it would tiptoe into the air quotes manic pixie dream girl type narrative but I don't think that has happened though it depends where the rest of this 
novel goes ultimately I think but their whole conversation in the middle of the night is very much like the film Before Sunrise that's a trilogy if you haven't seen it before it's two characters who meet each other and they end up just walking around and talking about life and the meaning of life and what they want to do with it um, and these characters Anna Rader and Danielle are talking about what goodness means and what they want to achieve in life and that is the whole of the first section that I have finished reading which is the first 50 pages which is a fifth of the book so I'm intrigued to see where this book goes now whether we're going to stick at university or if we're going to jump forward in time I don't know we will find out but I need to crack on with work now it's Friday I'll check in at the weekend Hi, I'm just back from a walk, it's the weekend. I don't know if you can hear the fridge. Has anyone else's fridge been playing up since all the heat waves that we have been having? I put it on a lower setting when it was in the 40s outside, but I think it's just been struggling to regulate the temperature. Um, I mean, I sympathize. Um, but it's been much louder than normal recently, and I'm really hoping that it doesn't die a death because that would be really sad. I'm gonna cook some pizza. This chair is also very noisy. Um, I've talked about pizza on here before, but to recap, in case you're new, you wanna make the most delicious pizza, may I recommend this flour here, which is um, the Caputo flour, zero, zero flour, to make the best pizza, in my opinion. This makes a lot. This makes enough for six to eight pizzas. What we tend to do is make a whole batch and maybe use a little bit of it to make some bread and then the rest we use to have pizza throughout the week because the dough will last a week once you've made it. So you want one of these, which is a kilo of this zero zero flour. You wanna mix this with one of the sachets, seven grams of yeast, 20 grams of salt and 600 milliliters of warm water. Mix it all together, knead it for 10 minutes, leave it to rise in a bowl for two hours, then cut it up into between six and eight pieces. It really depends on how much Tupperware you've got. If you've got six Tupperware, then cut it into six. If you have eight, then, then do eight. So you wanna split it into six or eight roughly equal pieces, make each one into a dough ball, put it in the Tupperware, close the lid, and then leave the Tupperware out for about six hours and then put it in the fridge overnight. And then you wanna take each Tupperware out of the fridge two hours before you want to make the pizza and as I said it can live in the fridge for maybe not an entire week but at least for five days. So I made the dough yesterday and um, some of our Tupperware is currently in the freezer because I made stock recently so I put more than I normally would in one bit of Tupperware and when I came back to look at it it kind of exploded a bit. Here is the evidence of that and made me laugh quite a lot. Anyway I'm going to make the pizza now what I do is I do it in a frying pan on the hob because we don't have the broil setting in the UK, which I think you have in the States. So I do it in a pan on the hob to crisp up the bottom and make it all bubble. Then I put the toppings on top and then put it under the grill to melt the cheese and make the crust um, brown. That's what I do. Anyway, so I'm gonna make some tomato-based pizzas, but I'm also gonna make this as well, which you can't have too much of because it's quite rich but I do really love it. So what I do is on the pizza base, I put this. Sorry, the chair is so loud, <laughs> it's so squeaky, I shouldn't have sat on it. So I use this, which is black summer truffle pesto. So I use that instead of a tomato base. And then I add a bit of mozzarella, put it under the grill to melt the mozzarella. And then on top of that, I add some rocket, some Parmesan shavings, and this balsamic glaze and it is delicious. As I said, it's rich. It's almost like a garlic bread type thing. So I don't tend to eat loads of it, but as a treat, it's nice. So let's cook that. Ba 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 
chair but we're just gonna go with it so I finished reading The Watch by B.B. Berkey this book is like so many different books thrown together I mentioned in the last clip or several clips ago that the beginning was very reminiscent of Before Sunrise and also The Secret History and then it turns into a completely different type of book and I was reading it and I was thinking do I like this do I love it do I not like it it really threw me because of the change in pace and also subject matter. So you're following one woman's life over the course of about 20 years and it gets very impatient. The narrator gets very impatient. She wants to tell you things about her life. So at the beginning, she spends quite a lot of time setting the scene, telling you about jobs that she's getting and what she wants to do in life. And then she'll just skip whole sections of her life and she'll give you fragments of scenes. And I found it very frustrating, but it was also something the narrator was deliberately doing. She even addresses it at one point. Let me find that. Yeah, she says, events, is that all I can give you? I'm sorry if they make little sense, but you must understand I'm on this journey with you at exactly the same time as you. As you read these events, so do I. As you try and grasp their relevance, so do I. And I thought, well, that's very convenient, isn't it? <laughs> but I allowed myself to be swept up in this version of storytelling in that I will give you a little bit of story here and a little bit here. I allowed myself to ignore for the most part all the seams that I could see in this storytelling because you can see the author going I need to add this bit here so that you'll understand this next bit and I should probably tag this little bit on here but I don't want to tell you all of it so I'll just tell you part of it and as I said the narrator admits that she's doing that and I thought either this is really brilliant or it's a very clever way of addressing the flaws that you know are within your book it's one of those novels that heavily relies on the ending as to whether or not the way it gets there works and having reached the ending I conclude yes I think it did. There's a bit of a crime investigative thing going on in this book which I don't want to give details of at all because um spoiler territory and I did guess some of what was happening but not all of it which I think is a very good balance you want that you want to feel as though you have sussed some things out and you want to be pleasantly surprised as well I did like the symmetry in this book I did like how everything was brought together at the end I don't think this is going to be one of my favorite books ever but I appreciated it and I think I will think about it quite often. So that was, that, was, that was a pleasant reading experience. And then likewise, I have now read The Sonambulist Cookbook by Andrew McConnell. And this isn't um, one of my like, favorite books ever either, but there were several poems in here that I really gelled with. And to be honest, that's mostly what I want from a poetry collection. Obviously, I wanna find poetry collections that I adore in their entirety, and sometimes I do, but I read so much poetry that just finding a collection where I love maybe a third or a quarter of the poems is 
enough for me finding those hidden gems and my favourite poem in this collection was the title poem which is a, a long sequence which is called The Snubbiest Cookbook and this is a surrealist poem and it has quite a um, strong narrative as well. I would say actually most of these have a strong narrative. A couple of the poems for me maybe dip into the melodramatic but not this one. I thought that this one was magical and whimsical and full of intrigue. It says Someone said they saw me walking across the bypass bridge a few nights back, but they were mistaken. I thought I saw myself at the railway sidings as I came in on the late night train, but it was just my reflection. I found myself in the conservatory one night. I was so tiny, I stood on myself to get over the wall. I love that. I thought it was great. Okay, this afternoon, Mr. M and I are walking over to his mum's house again because she's still away. She's back tomorrow. So we're going to go and feed penny slope again and I think I'm going to take a board game well a card game that's very light to carry it's this here which is Illamat which we bought a couple of years ago and I bought it because Carson Ellis does the illustrations and I love her illustrations I think many people buy it because is she married to someone who's in the Decemberists that's it and I think there's lots of references to their songs I haven't listened to any of their songs so I don't get those references I just bought it because it's a very beautiful card game so I think we will sit in her garden and play that while Penny has a run around uh, and then we'll probably come back home so I'll insert footage of that here and I'll check in with you tomorrow. It is Sunday and we're about to go for a walk along Regent's Canal in a minute but before we do that I wanted to check in and say that I have read Room of Thieves by Angela Cleland and I really love this collection. It has themes that I really enjoy reading about such as folklore, nature poetry, specifically Scottish nature poetry, we've got stuff to do with girlhood and also life and death and the realisation that things in nature grow out of other things that have perished and really paying close attention to that murky territory and then applying it to other aspects of life, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I mentioned in a previous clip that I would like to do a close reading of one of the poems, so let's do that. Um, I will read the poem to you and then I'm gonna annotate it and we can talk about it briefly. So the poem in question is called Two Young Bucks. And there they are, up and already writing my poem, walking stop motion with hackneyed knees, spooking each other with their ear flick and eye white, kicking up the warning flags of their tails. They are fickle as children. Whatever it was is forgotten after five sprung bounds, one jumps at the other as if to say, ha, I am brave, really. And the two princes play at kings, budded heads down and butted tight, burling in a spray of cool dew, spiraling closer, young and artless, winding the morning down about them like a fine yarn. Let's grab a pen. Here we go. Excuse my handwriting. I don't really write with a pen anymore because um, of my arthritis. So my, my, my writing is not as neat as it used to be. Um, so two young bucks and we have stanzas here, each of two lines and the two lines are to reflect the fact that there are two young bucks, two young deer that this narrator is watching. And I love the opening line of this. And there they are up and already writing my poem. Like she has interrupted their artistic practice. They were already there. They have conjured this poem into existence. There's something very mythic about that. And she's got the repeating sounds here, the assonance of hackneyed knees, so that it's very pleasing to read out. 
And I love how she says that they are spooking each other. It creates this image of them being ghost-like or a mirage reflected in the colour white, which is obviously associated with ghosts as well. Like, she's walked into this scene. It's early morning. She's not sure if she's still asleep, if she's woken up, if this is something that she's dreaming, because it has materialised so beautifully. But then the more that she looks at them, she realises that they are as fickle as children. Whatever it was, forgotten. So... They are fickle as children, they have forgotten what they're doing, i.e. creating a beautiful scene for this poem, very calm and scenic, because then they start messing around with each other and playing because they're just young, and that in some ways breaks the spell. She says, after five sprung bounds, one jumps, and five sprung bounds, obviously, they are jumping about on the grass, but there's also been five lines before that. So they've had five bounds, five lines of this artistic majesty, and then one of them jumps and the line breaks there to reflect the jump at the other, and they're being very playful, and she realises, no, they're just children. They have these horns, which are like buds, like flowers, and actually they are artless. They don't have all of these characteristics, which she assumed they do. They're not kings. They are playing at being kings. She has conjured their personalities through folklore. She has mythologized them and now she's presented with the real life versions of them which are very playful. It says they are spiraling closer to her and the two line stanzas here do almost create a spiral coming down and the last line says they are winding the morning about them like a fine yarn. Again that refers back to the beginning as almost she's seeing these creatures through a mirage or like a spider's web or morning dew that's being spun in front of her but of course fine yarn is textiles but it could also be a story like they are creating a story around themselves and she's part of that process as someone who's observing it and also writing it down i really enjoyed this poem i thought it was great okay i'm gonna go for a walk now along regent's canal come join us wasn't a fan of these two books here. It's just a case of personal taste. I tried the beginning of both of them and they didn't speak to me. That's fine. We all like different things. So I'm going to pass these ones on to someone else. And that means that we have reached the end of this experiment. Did it go well? I think it did, you know, and we can see that in the numbers. So there were four books out of the 10 that I didn't particularly enjoy that weren't personally for me and that's absolutely fine. We know that there was also a book in this box that I had already read but really enjoyed when I read it 10 years ago or whenever that was. So if this had been a book that I found for the first time, I would have enjoyed it. And then the other five books that I hadn't read before, I also really enjoyed. And if I had to rank these five in order of enjoyment, I would say the one I enjoyed the least but still enjoyed is the Snabulous Cookbook. After that, The Watch by B.B. Berkey. After that, Changing Room. And then we've got Room of Thieves. And then the book that I think I enjoyed the most was A Perfect Explanation by Elena Anstruther. So I enjoyed half of these books and I would say that I really enjoyed four of them. The A.J. Ashworth and then the top three new to me books. So for 10 random books, I think that that is pretty good going. Thank you for joining me for this video. I will link 
the mystery box of books down below if you would like to buy it check it out yourself i will also link all of the titles individually in the description box both the ones that were in my box and the ones that i recommended at the beginning of this video go over to salt's website show them some love they publish some really great stuff i hope that you liked this video if you enjoyed this video and you're new and you would like to subscribe that'd be great and if you enjoy my content and would like to consider supporting me on patreon that'd be very kind link to that is in the description box down below support over on patreon means that i can keep making free content for everybody on here taking the time to make it accessible and there's also some extra stuff over on Patreon too. I hope you're all having a good start to the week and I will speak to you very soon. Sending love. Bye.